don't have these conversations on social media. Believe me, it's an extremely effective communication tool. It has a great ability to reach a lot of people in a short amount of time. However, it reaches a lot of people in a short amount of time with a text-based format. I would say don't even have this conversation over a text message, even though that's much more personal and people are more apt to think a lot more about their individual message towards you. I would say don't even have it there. Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell that supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. The scripture tells us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So we're supposed to have the cunning to be able to change a person's mind on something. To have that conversation to where we're clever and thoughtful and we are able to impart to them wisdom that God has given us. But we're also supposed to be harmless as doves. So unlike the snake who uses his cunning for evil, we're supposed to also project an air of harmlessness and, and an air of compassion and empathy. And some of the celebration I've seen over the weekend by Christians has been the exact opposite of that. A good example that I could bring up, and, and this is one that I've seen, unfortunately, on several different occasions. And I was talking to my buddy over at, at church Sunday, and he mentioned a story that was almost identical to a couple of the scenarios that I've seen on social media. Whereas like, you know, where uh, somebody had mentioned that they were in a, a bad situation and this woman was seeking out an abortion, the response was, well, should have kept her legs crossed. That's not really projecting an air of harmlessness and love. That's projecting a air of, I don't care about this person. And um, well, you know, you, I, I know you're in a bad situation, but basically that, that's what you get. Now, there is an element of truth in that, that your own poor decisions led you to a situation that you were not prepared to handle. That is correct. Just because that is correct doesn't mean that that should be the only thing we concern ourselves with. Like, they made a bad decision, ergo, I don't have to worry about that person. I don't have to care about that person anymore because they made a mistake. There is nothing further from the heart of God than that attitude. And so because of that, we need to be very aware of how we're coming off and the way that we engage people in these kinds of discussions. And so I'm going to give you a few tips here, because remember, this is what tactics is all about. It is about communicating with people and telling you how to have difficult conversations with people who may disagree with you or may even be on the fence on some issues. And so I'm just going to give some generic tips. You could really utilize a lot of these in any conversation about a sensitive topic, but I've tailored some of them specifically to abortion. So uh, going through a couple of them real quickly. First of all, it kind of goes back to the example that I just gave. Don't use intentionally inflammatory language. So language that is designed to hurt, that it is specifically tailored to get under somebody's skin, that's not helpful. Maybe it makes you feel good. Maybe you get a lot of likes from it because, you know, you just eviscerated somebody. And there may even be an element of truth to it. Like I just pointed out, there's an element of truth to the argument, well, you should have kept your legs closed. But there are better ways to say that. You know, you can come at it from a place of compassion, caring about that person, and wanting to have a conversation to, to go back and forth and to learn some things from each other. But inflammatory language almost always makes people go to their corners. And it's very difficult to have a conversation that actually changes somebody's mind when both of you are busy trying to punch each other. Like, that's just not generally the way good conversations happen rhetorically. And so when two people are just trying to outdo one another or just trying to win the argument, it's very rare that at some point somebody cools off and says, hey, let's, let's actually discuss the issue that we're talking about. And so don't use inflammatory language, and that would include, by the way, ad hominem attacks like that. Don't, don't attack people. Attack ideas. One of the things about Robert's Rules, which is the form of debate that I'm well-versed in, I'm a registered parliamentarian, one of, the, uh, one of the things that is a part of parliamentary procedure is you don't argue with the person, you argue with the debate. And so when you get up and you debate, 
You don't look at the other person. You don't talk directly to the other person. You don't mention the other member's name. You say the previous speaker or the person that made this point, something to that effect. You don't make it a personal attack. You don't even direct it towards the person that made the argument. You're arguing with the idea, not the person. Now, obviously, when you're in a less formal debate setting, like maybe just talking to somebody that disagrees with you at a, a family get together or because you're friends and have coffee or a coworker or something like that, you're not as formal with it, but the idea and the principle is still the same. You're attacking their ideas. You're not attacking them. And if you keep that in mind, you will have much more civil conversations and people will recognize that and they will feel less defensive when you do something like that. Another one that kind of goes hand in hand with that is you want to ask a lot of questions. And I don't mean badger them, and I don't mean you ask questions snidely to try to get them into a trap. Genuinely ask some questions. And there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, when you ask a lot of questions, what that does is it, it lessens the, the probability that you will ask a question or make an assumption about their belief that you misunderstood. I've seen people have whole arguments where if they just ask a clarification question or two very early on in the conversation could have been completely avoided. And interestingly enough, sometimes the two people actually wind up agreeing with one another most on, on most of the thing, but they found like some point of contention or, or maybe even they agree, but they don't realize they agree. And because they didn't ask a question about what that person believes, sometimes it's okay to take a break and say, okay, let me make sure I'm understanding you here and then restate what you understood about what they were saying. And so asking a lot of questions is a good tip to follow. Uh, and it also, what it does is it kind of uses the Socratic method that if somebody makes a claim, don't just let the claim hang, make them actually justify their claim. Because a lot of times what happens is somebody will make a claim that is incorrect or untruthful, and maybe they even know it's untruthful, or they did so in error, making a claim that they didn't realize they made. And so what happens there is the best counter to that is to say, okay, you cited that, you cited that, you know, for example, in this debate, um, Christians don't actually help orphans or widows or anything. Can, can you, can you justify that claim? Where are you getting that information? Because I guarantee you a lot of times on stuff like that, they're just parroting talking points that they've been told and they don't actually know whether it's true or not. And if that is true, then they will either realize, oh, I actually don't know that. Maybe I should look into it myself. It might spur on a little curiosity in their own mind, and it gives you a chance to rebut that claim without uh, making it seem like you're attacking them. If you ask them, hey, where are you getting that information? And then you explain to them that the point that they just made is incorrect, then all of a sudden you don't look like somebody that's just trying to badger them. You look like someone that is genuinely trying to understand, which should be the way that you actually are. It shouldn't just be an act. It should be sincere. And so because of that, that's a good way to help them sort of lower their defenses as well. And sort of to that point, there's a lot of people that are a lot more pro-life than they think. So for example, on this issue, there might be a person that considers themselves pro-choice because they believe that a woman should have the option up until about 15 weeks. That's actually a pretty common, and we'll look at some stats here in a second, that's actually not an uncommon stance for people to take as Americans. However, they don't realize that that, that would be a pretty pro-life stance. Like, 15 weeks is what the Mississippi law was. And so a lot of people would talk about how horrible the Mississippi law is, and then if you ask them, okay, so where do you think the woman should have a cutoff date as far as when she shouldn't be allowed to have an abortion. Now, some of them will say, you know, up until the point of birth. But a lot of Americans, that if you ask them that question, they say, well, it should be pretty early in the presidency, like, er, pre pre presidency, pretty early in the pregnancy, like, you know, maybe 15 weeks or something. And then you say, well, actually, that's what the Mississippi law was, is it was a ban on abortions after 15 weeks. And so, see, then all of a sudden, they're like, huh, maybe I don't know enough about this. And it's interesting that on this issue, you would have some people that consider themselves pro-life, but she should have the option up till 15 weeks or pro-choice because I think that they should have the choice up until that point. So you could actually have two people that hold exactly the same belief that label themselves as pro-life or pro-choice. 
And so that's why it's important, especially on this issue, to ask a lot of questions because you may find that the person doesn't actually disagree with you as much as you think. And so that is certainly a possibility. And I think that this is also an incredibly important part of this with abortion or any topic. When you ask a lot of questions, it informs the other person that you actually care about them. You actually care about their ideas. You're trying to learn. You're trying to listen. You're trying to learn more about them and what they think. It's not just, I am going to impart my wisdom upon you from on high because I know things and you don't. It's, hey, why don't we just get together and reason together? That's what Philip said in the Gospels. And so it's, it's an appropriate Christian attitude to adopt that I don't know everything. I'm not perfect. So why don't we try to learn from one another instead of just trying to snipe at one another or, uh, you know, try to win an argument? Why don't we actually have a, a real conversation between, uh, between our, ourselves? That's a good attitude to have. Another thing that you can do, and this is extremely important for having a productive conversation, never, and I do mean never, assume malice unless you have a very good reason to assume malice. Like, if somebody basically uh, does a character assault, then there might be a little bit of malice in there. But unless you have a very good reason to assume that the other person doesn't like you, uh, you know, has some kind of vendetta against you, never assume that just because they said something that disagrees with you. And the reason that I stress that and the reason that I say that is important is because an awful lot of arguments go nowhere because the two people assume that the other person hates them even though that's not the case. And even if you do find that malice is present, that they actually are motivated by malice, and that's the reason that they're being so nasty to you, that does not give you permission to carpet bomb them. Like a lot of people, even people that would profess themselves to be Christians, they see something that they believe, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not, that there is a maliciousness from the person they're having a discussion with, and they're like, all right, he threw the first punch, therefore gloves off, let's go. That's not really a Christian attitude to have. Their behavior doesn't justify your bad behavior. And so because of that, you really have to be willing to be open and to have these conversations. And even if the other person is being mean or nasty, it doesn't give you a right to lash back. Now, if they are being malicious, that may be a good sign that this conversation is no longer worth having because I can't convince them no matter what if they're just, you know, wanting to, to throw haymakers at me all day long. You know, it may be time to kick the dust off of your feet because you don't want to throw your pearls before swine, which Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Like, that may be an indication of that, but it's not a permission slip to just attack them personally. So even if you do find malice, don't do that. Another tip that I would uh, bring up, ask them to look at things from your perspective. That can be a very powerful tool. And you don't have to ask this every, like, you, this shouldn't be something that every other time that you talk, say, just look at this from my perspective, but it is an effective tool that you can bring out on occasion. So for example, I've actually had discussions with people on abortion where this has been very effective, where I will say, okay, I, I hear what you're saying, but just look at it from my perspective. If I believe that an unborn child really is a human, can you understand why the woman's quote unquote right to an abortion kind of takes the back seat if we're talking about the life of another human being. And even if they wind up not agreeing with you, a lot of times when you ask that question, a reasonable person will look at that and go, you know, I kind of see where they're coming from. And that also helps bring down the walls and the defensiveness a little bit. And so because of that, that sort of spurs on some empathy. And, uh, a really good example of that with the abortion debate uh, would be like, I had somebody say that, well, I don't really know if there's life in the womb. I don't know if people that haven't been born yet really are a human and therefore entitled to a right to life and the protections that come with being just being a person. And so I said, well, look at it from my perspective here. Sometimes an analogy is helpful. Let's say that you're riding down the road. And right in the middle of the road, right in the middle of your lane, there is a giant cardboard box 
that very clearly you can read it from where you are has the word puppies across it. You don't know that puppies are in that box. You have no idea. In fact, it's very likely, I would say even more likely than not, because who's going to put a box of puppies in the middle of the road, that probably what happened is that somebody had a box that had puppies in it at one point and then threw the box out and somehow the wind blew it into the road or something. That's probably what happened. But if there is even a chance there's puppies in that box, why wouldn't you just move over into the other lane? See, if you're not sure, then you should err on the side of caution. If we don't know if that's a human life in there, shouldn't the default action be to not kill it, to leave it alone? Because uncertainty, you would err on the side of life, I would think. And so in the same way that you wouldn't just run over the box, even though it may not have any puppies in it, you wouldn't want to kill a baby living in a mother's womb if it is in fact a baby. If you aren't sure, then maybe that's the right path to take. And, and the person that was a pro-choice person actually said, you know, I, I, that kind of makes sense to me. And so I don't know if she actually wound up changing her mind on that, but I gave her something to think about. And so sometimes that can be a very powerful tool is to just ask the person to see things from your perspective. And then it's a much shorter walk over to actually taking your position if they kind of see where the rationale is coming from. And then finally, uh, I would say settle issues one at a time. Because a lot of times where you see an argument spiral out of control, Normally, the reason for that is because one person says one thing, and then the other person responds, and then the first person says, yeah, well, what about, and then they say something completely off topic from the exchange that just happened. That happens a lot, because a lot of times when people get engaged in an argument, whether they realize they're doing it or not, they'll have an argument, that argument will get rebutted, and then without saying anything else, they'll just change the subject because they don't like the cognitive dissonance that creates in their brain. And so when that happens, just very politely, very calmly, say, hang on just a second. Let's settle this first, and then we'll get over to the other topic that you're talking about. Like, for example, if you are talking about whether or not the person in the womb is indeed alive, and the person immediately goes to Oh, well, what about all the people that don't support them? I was like, oh, okay. Well, you know, that's a discussion worth having. But why don't we put a pin in that for right now and get back to the topic that we were discussing about whether or not the person is actually alive or not? Because whether or not a certain political party is supporting a group of people or not is really kind of immaterial to whether or not they're a person. And so on abortion or a lot of other political debates, that is a very effective tool in staying on topic and you're not wasting your time just running around in circles trying to put out fires every time they bring up a brand new argument. So that actually helps a lot too. And this would kind of be a bonus one. This is not a hard and fast rule, which is why I'm putting it in the bonus category. There are times where this could be a productive conversation, but it's super, super, super rare. And that is don't have these conversations on social media. Believe me, it's an extremely effective communication tool. It has a great ability to reach a lot of people in a short amount of time. However, it reaches a lot of people in a short amount of time with a text-based format. I would say don't even have this conversation over a text message, even though that's much more personal and people are more apt to think a lot more about their individual message towards you. I would say don't even have it there. If you want to have a conversation of substance that can actually change somebody's mind and will actually help improve your understanding of your own arguments and your own position as well, you need to have that conversation face to face. It's more personal. It, uh, it doesn't completely absolve you from, but it goes a long way in keeping the issue of thinking that there's malice behind something. It keeps that at bay. It makes the odds of that significantly less likely. And so there's a lot of reasons why you should strive to have these arguments face-to-face -face with a person in a room, preferably in a place where you can kind of sit down, be comfortable, and hash a lot of these things out. And sometimes you don't have that opportunity. Sometimes, you, sometimes you're just not there. Sometimes these conversations spring up in places you don't expect. If it is an option and if it is reasonable, Ask the person if they'd like to continue the conversation in more depth 
at a different time where they can really get into the conversation. And if they can't do that or won't do that, or, or maybe you can't do that for whatever reason, like maybe you're from out of town, something like that, you're visiting somebody, then yeah, maybe try to have a little bit of that conversation there and then. But it's always better if you're going to have a serious conversation that might actually affect how someone thinks, if you can do it in a setting that's more conducive to that actually taking place. And so those would be my tips for having the conversation. To convince you to like this video and subscribe to my channel, I'm about to do some political impersonations. First up, Bernie Sanders. It is immoral that in this country, the top 1% of YouTubers get all the likes and subscriptions. John Kerry. Please remember to ring the notification bell. President Joe Biden. If you like the show, call the TV Guide and tell them. You know, the thing. Kamala Harris. Batman would want you to like and subscribe. 